Okay, so thank you for sticking around for the very last session. We're in the home stretch, so I really appreciate you being here. So that's a very good thing. And I want to talk a lot about a theme that we haven't focused on explicitly in this conference so far, which is the importance of reproducible research in high throughput biology. As these, as we're generating better and better assays, and we're generating more and more measurements, thousands of things, it becomes increasingly important since the analysis takes a larger and larger chunk of time that at some stage, not only us, but others should be able to precisely reproduce what we did. In other words, if they start with the same numbers, should they get the same results? And we'd like that to be true. Now, this is actually really important in high throughput biology for a somewhat different reason, which is simply that, um, and once I will get this advanced, then we will tell you what it is. Let's see. Okay, well, I can gesture and I can tell you what it is, um, which is simply that our intuition about what makes sense in high throughput biology actually is pretty darn poor. What I mean by that is that in many cases, I've worked with clinicians where I've gone in and I've said, this gene has gone up, and that means these people are most, more likely to develop advanced cancer. And the clinician has turned to me and said, no, what that means is that you've got stromal contamination in your samples, because I've worked with that gene for 15 years and I know how it behaves. And they're right. They have intuition for single genes. On the other hand, if I go to that same clinician and I give him a, the following signature of 100 genes, and I say, this goes up, well, they'll stare at this list of 100 genes and they'll say, yeah, I can see that because this will influence this and this will influence this. And it's wonderful. It's a Rorschach test for biologists to give them a gene list of 100 things. And unfortunately, we've tried the null experiment of giving a random list to some of our biologists and they still find patterns. <laughs> so this is somewhat of a warning. Now, in light of this, we find it somewhat dismaying that when we go to the literature and we take a, take a typical paper and we try to figure out what was done, the documentation is often poor. And if the documentation is poor, in some cases, if the finding is important, we are forced to resort to what we have come to refer to as forensic bioinformatics, which involves starting with the results and the raw data and saying, what must they have done to get from one place to the other, regardless of what the methods say they did? Okay, and I want to illustrate this and how important this might be by considering a specific clinical example, specifically using signatures, genomic signatures, to try to predict response to chemosensitivity. And this is actually based on work that appeared a few years ago now, at the end of 2006. This is a paper that showed up in Nature Medicine. And what they said, what they claimed in this paper, was that they'd figured out a really great thing. Specifically, starting with cell lines, they'd figured out how to come up with genomic signatures of sensitivity to a whole bunch of drugs. So here's how this worked. They're not just working with any panel of cell lines, they're working with the NCI60. And the NCI60, as was alluded to in the last talk, is a very special thing. One reason it's very special is that it's a standard panel maintained by the National Cancer Institute. And what that means is that if you've got a new chemotherapeutic, that agent will be sent to the National Cancer Institute and they will test it for efficacy against this panel of 60 cell lines. And that that information about which drugs are most effective against which cells, that's public data. You can go and you can download it, and you can download this information for every single chemotherapeutic now available. So if you can figure out how to leverage that information, that's potentially a way to use or choose the best single drug that's out there for a given patient. So what they said was they said, okay, using the NCI60, let's start with a drug of interest like docetaxel. Let's pick the most sensitive and most resistant cell lines. Okay, those are our extra Streams. Let's take array profiles of those cell lines. Okay, fine. Let us contrast them and identify the genes that are most different between group one and group two. These genes will comprise elements of our sensitivity signature. And then they say, let's fit a model to come up with the sensitivity signature. And for doing this, they use metagenes, which sounds really cool, but to mathematicians, we otherwise know it, know it as principal components, and I'm going to use that terminology. Um, and they're going to say, okay, using these metagenes, let's try to fit, the, fit the, the, the cell lines and predict on clinical samples. And they tried this with a whole bunch of public data sets using seven commonly used agents. They reported great results. And I know this was really splashy because within two weeks of this paper appearing, we had three different groups at MD Anderson coming to us in bioinformatics and saying, we want to do this. Help us do it. And being helpful bioinformaticians, we said, well, sure, we'd love to do that. And in particular, since all of the data involved is public, 
we should be able to go out and figure out how to do it ourselves and generalize it to other trials. So okay, Let, so let's let's try that. And we decided to try that starting with docetaxel. So we're starting with the most ex sensitive and most resistant cell lines. In this case, we're going to be using U95A arrays for the NCI60. These arrays were run in triplicates, so we've got three for each. And when we did this and we tried to fit the training data, here is a plot of the first two principal components of these things. And what you can see, not too surprisingly, is that you have some pretty clear separation between all the resistant ones at the left and all the sensitive ones at the right. This little triangle of three things, those are three replicates of the same cell line. So that's sort of what we expect to see. Now this separation should not surprise you. This is the training set. We have picked the genes specifically to achieve this separation. What we now want to see is we now want to see clinical samples projected into this same space and see this separation so that we can use it ourselves. So we took the predicted, uh, the, set, the, the actual patient information and we projected it into this space. And we did not see the separation that we were really hoping and expecting to see. So of course, this led to the natural question of, did we do something wrong? And this is, of course, well, now we're going to start to reconstruct exactly what was done. And to do this, we began by saying, OK, um, well, okay, what were the signatures or the, the specific genes that they used for the individual drugs? And this is actually somewhat easy because in the supplementary material to their paper, they included, here are the lists for each drug of all the Affymetrix probe set IDs that are involved and all the genes that are involved. And in, in the paper, they also gave some exp explanations about, here are some genes that make sense in the context of this drug because it explains the biology and so on like that. So, okay, so we decided to pick one of the drugs and we started with 5-fluorouracil and what we wanted be able to do with this is we want to be able to construct a heat map that looks like this. This is a heat map that actually showed up in the paper. This is of the 45 genes that they picked out for 5-fluorouracil. And one of the things that you can see is this plaid pattern because every one of the 45 genes has a pattern that we like. In other words, it's either high in one group and low in the other or low than high. So, okay, extreme separation. That's what we expect. That's what we want in the cell lines. So, well, how'd they pick these? Well, they picked these using two sample t-tests and I'm a PhD level statistician, so I've figured out how to do two sample t-tests by this point. So we tried it ourselves. So here's our best 45 using t-tests. So okay, great. And then we said, all right, let's take the list of Affymetrix probe set IDs for their 45 and take a look at that heat map. And um, we didn't see, again, what we were expecting to see. So we then decided to try something uh, which we've learned to unfortunately do every once in a while, which is be just a bit paranoid about the data. And what we did then was we took our list and theirs and we put them side by side. So there's their list and there's ours. Does anybody notice a pattern here? <laughs> What we have here is indeed an off by one indexing error. This is true for all of the genes in this signature. Now, what does that say to you about whether or not certain genes making sense in terms of the biology really holds when they're referencing a set of genes that actually isn't involved? So now, of course, this is just one drug. They looked at seven, so there's six others. So what we decided to do for these six others was we basically took their reported AFI IDs moved down one and looked at the p-values to see if they were really small. So let's see. Well, topo tecan, yep, they're all off by one. Etoposide off by one. Adriamycin, mostly off by one. There's a few we can't explain. Paclitaxel, mostly off by one. Docetaxel, mostly off by one. And cytoxin, we have no earthly idea what they did with this drug. Um, so, okay, fine. We've got this and we know that that's one problem. Now, how is it that this problem could arise? And to answer that one, we went in and we looked at the software that they were using. And as a side note, if you want to read documentation on how this software works, you should go to our website because I wrote it because we couldn't find any. Um, and one of the things that we noted was that their software in order to work required two input files. The first input file is the quantification matrix, genes by samples, and this matrix needs a header row where the header is either zero, one, or two to indicate that this is a training sample sensitive, training sample resistant, or a test sample whose outcome we don't know. That's the first input, the quantification matrix. The second input is a list of gene IDs gene names in the same order as in the quantification matrix, but for their software to work correctly, this second input must not have a header row. So if you start with an Excel file and you copy and you paste and you've got a title at the top that says gene name, guess what happens? 
you will get an off by one indexing error. And if you run this through your software, we tried this with those Dosotaxel, and we perfectly matched the heat maps. And we also got some of these offset genes, so we know that that works. But again, that's one drug, Dosotaxel, out of seven. So what happens with the other six? Well, let's take a look. Okay, Topotecan, we can perfectly match the heat maps. We know what cell lines are involved, we know what genes they should be producing. Okay, fine. Adriamycin, perfect, etoposide, perfect, 5-FU, perfect, Paclitaxel, well, they mislabeled it as cyclophosphamide in the paper, but okay. Um, and cyclophosphamide, we still have no worries the idea of what they did with this gene. Um, so, okay, there's, there, there's this thing that we can perfectly match the heat maps for six of the seven drugs. We understand what they did. Now, actually, before we go on, I should note that this should actually bother you. And the reason it should bother you is that we've perfectly matched the heat maps for six of the seven drugs, but we managed to perfectly match the gene lists for only three. For four of the drugs, there are included other genes that we can't explain just yet. Um, they are outliers. And we'll come back to those because before we get there, we also noticed in using their software that something that was more important to us, which was that their software also gave predictions. And this is the clinical thing that we're really interested in. We want to know, is this patient going to be sensitive or not? So we wanted to see, can we get good predictions out of this software? And the way we're going to check this, uh, well, there's a bit of a problem in that the paper doesn't say for the fit and data sets that they fit, this patient turned out to be sensitive, this one resistant. No, they just gave us an overall rate of accuracy, okay, so that they got, if they've got 24 patients, they got 22 of them right. Okay, fine. So we're going to say that we understand the classification algorithm or this thing well enough to use it if we can get accuracies at least as good as the ones that they report, okay? That's our bar. So that, of course, brings about the next question, which is just how good are the accuracy rates that they obtain? So we're going to look at this in the context of docetaxel, and this top plot is a figure from the paper, and you can see the scores for the sensitive patients, and they're mostly low with blue squares, that's good. Resistant ones are high, and they've got red triangles, and that's good. And I have a question here. I have an analysis question for the audience. The analysis question is, how many blue squares are there? Thirteen. That is correct. We have, up there in the top plot, 13 sensitive samples and 11 resistant ones. Now, there's a second panel on this page right here. The thing is, this panel doesn't come from this paper. This panel comes from a paper by Chang et al. They're the ones that actually introduced the test set being analyzed here. And according to Chang et al., they thought that they had 11 sensitive and 13 resistant. So 13 and 11, or 11 and 13. Um, that may be a problem, so we decided to take a look at a different drug, namely adriamycin. And for those of you who are real math whizzes here, do, how many red triangles are there? <laughs> okay. For those who aren't quite that ambitious, are there more red triangles or blue squares? Come on. This is not a trick question. I hear red triangles. Or what? So basically, we've got a whole bunch of patients that are resistant to therapy. The problem is, in this case, the underlying data set that supplied this thing, this was from a paper on childhood leukemia. The reason this is a problem is that childhood leukemia is a disease for, actually, for which we've actually got a pretty good cure rate, around 80%. And what that means is that if we've got a drug to which most of the patients are resistant, we wouldn't be using it. And indeed, if we go back to the original paper that submitted it, they thought that most of their patients were sensitive. So what do we think is going on? We think that for 0 and 1, they swapped the interpretation in feeding it into the data, and they didn't realize what they were doing. Now, what does this mean clinically? It means that, what, well, they're going to use that signature, and they're going to administer adriamycin just to the patients who will derive no benefit from it. This is poor clinical practice. So we don't think this is a good idea. So given this, there is the question of, OK, if they're mixing things up this badly, how is it that they're getting good predictions in the first place? And actually, this leads back to one of the things that we passed on just a few minutes ago, which is that there were some other genes. And in particular for docetaxel, there were 50 genes. If we take our list of docetaxel and we do this off by one trick, we match 31. That leaves 19. Of these 19, there's the question of where can they come from? Well, if you go back to the initial paper by Chang et al. that supplied the test set, they say, if you want to separate our resistance from our sensitives, here's a list of 92 genes that'll do the job. So we said, OK, let's take a look at the 19 we can't match and compare them with the 92 they report. And we find out that there is an overlap of 14 genes. There you go. They are entries 7 through 20 in this list, one contiguous block. I think we have some statisticians in the audience, so quick question. If I pick 14 items at random from a list with 92 in it, how often do they all, all appear right next to each other? 
The p-value is small. You can get published with this one. Um, okay. Now, of course, this still leaves five. What are the other five? Well, they're the ERCC1, ERCC4, ERMB2, BCL2, L11, and Tuba3. The thing that, that the common theme of these five is that these are the genes mentioned by name in the paper to explain why the signature works. So, for the docetaxel signature, we have the genes that work to split the test set, the genes that work to split the training set, and the genes that are there to explain why it works, and there is no overlap between these three. We thought this was somewhat disturbing. Um, so we wrote a letter to Nature Medicine, and one of the things about this being a talk on reproducible research is that you don't have to take my word for it, which means that you can go to Nature Medicine, you can read the paper, you can also read our reports, which contain all of our code, you can run it through R, and you will get the same numbers we do. As a side note for data compression, our note to Nature Medicine is 700 words. There's 140 pages of supplementary material for those 700 words there, so there's a bit of a compression there. So that one's fun. and so. All the data is there. And then, of course, we waited to see, OK, is there a response? So they say, oh, well, whoops, we got it wrong. We'll fix it next time. Well, no, that wasn't quite the response. The response was, well, unfortunately, the analysis of Baggerly and Coombs is deeply flawed. Um, and amongst other errors, well, first off, for adriamycin, the labels, this is the one where they had a lot of red triangles, the labels are actually correct. And we've posted details on our website to illustrate this. And they must be wrong because we've gotten this approach to work again. And in their rebuttal, they note that they've done it twice in new papers with editorials and things like that. So we must have screwed up. And well, given the timing, I'm not going to be able to go through all of these. But I want to look at some of the, the data for one or two of these just to, just to illustrate what might be going on. So let's start with adriamycin. For adriamycin, they say they've got the labels correct on their website. So we went to their web page and we said, what's there? Well, actually, when we went there, we saw that there were there's a table of quantifications for 144 samples. 22 for training cell lines and 122 for tests. These are the patient ones for which they're making predictions. And we said, well, maybe we can find something that separates the responders from the non-responders. So we decided, let's try to cluster it. And as a prelude to that, let's just check the correlations between individual pairs of elements. And what I'm going to show you now is a plot of all the really high correlations we see in this matrix of 144 samples. Here's the submatrix corresponding to the training data, the cell lines. And here's the test data. Now, the red line on the main diagonal we expected. Samples are indeed highly correlated with themselves. That's good. However, we didn't expect these red dots off the main diagonal. What's going on? Well, turns out they have 122 test samples. But the 122 are not all distinct. There are some samples that they have reused two, three, or even four times. And there's a sample right about here, which has been reused four times, which has been labeled as resistant three times out of four. Now, that's the same sample. So we're pretty, cons pretty convinced that the labels are not all correct, even now. So we sent a further note to Nature Medicine about this. And Nature Medicine forwarded this on to the authors. And then they got back to us and said, well, they'll adjust it so we see no need to publish your note. OK, fine. Um, and indeed, what they said later in August of 08 was that they had redone the analysis using only the 95 unique samples. And they'd again gotten great results. Now, for those of you who were listening to me carefully before, you will recall that I said that there were actually 84 distinct samples. So hearing that there were 95 was a bit of a surprise to us. So OK, but fine. And what they do now? Well, when they corrected this in August 08, they actually took down the quantifications and they just put up a list of the 95 GOIDs of the arrays involved. So let me show you the first 20 of the 95 they now list. And I've highlighted a few of them because that's used twice, that's used twice, this one's used twice and labeled both ways. So actually, of the 95, which is, this is the second correction, by the way, um, 15 are in duplicate. Of those 15, 16, 6 are labeled both ways. And furthermore, since they've actually noted, now told us the GOIDs of the individual arrays, we can actually go back and figure out what the initial submitters thought they were in terms of resistant or sensitive. So, the group, that's, the, the dupe group says that 61 are resistant, 13 are sensitive, and 6 we don't know. The people submitting the data thought that 22 were resistant, 48 were sensitive, and 10 they labeled as intermediate. They didn't classify them. So for adriamycin, we're not convinced this works. 
Well, all right. There's still other things that they put out there. There's other papers with editorials, so let me show you one of those. This is a paper that showed up in the Journal of Clinical Oncology by Sue et al. And in this paper, they extended the approach to deal with two new drugs, cisplatin and pemetrexid. These are important in treating lung cancer. And one of the things that they thought was really neat was that they said, OK, we actually don't like the NCI60 for all drugs, so we're going to shift to a different set of cell lines. And these cell lines were profiled on athe u 133 a arrays. And one of the things that they did using this was they came up with a signature for cisplatin. And for cisplatin, they pointed out something important. Specifically, that the signature that they found contained ERCC1, ERCC4, and DNA repair genes. That's important because there have been several papers in the New England Journal saying these are related to how you treat lung cancer. So that's really cool. So what did we do? Well, we took the data and we said, all right, let's try to see if we can match the heat map so we know the cell lines and the genes involved. And after, uh, with some work, and that's another compression thing there, uh, we did manage to exactly match the heat maps. And for cisplatin, after we exactly exactly matched the heat map, we took a look at the genes involved, and we discovered that we could match 41 of the 45 genes they report after accounting for this off by one error that's still there. There's four that we can't match at all. Do I have any guesses from the audience as to the identities of those four? The four that we cannot match are ERCC1, ERCC4, ERCC1 again, and FANCM. And of these four, the last two are special because, as it turns out, those two aren't on the U133A arrays. They're on the U133B. So two of their best genes they haven't measured yet, but hey, who needs to conduct experiments if you know the answer? This is a wonderful finding. OK, great. Um, so we were disturbed by this. As a side note, we submitted a correction for this one to JCO, and they sent us a note back saying, we're sorry, we can't publish this. Um, and we said, OK, fine. Um, and over the next few years, what what went on from there is that there were other papers that kept on coming, 07, 08, 09. But middle of last year, we learned something new that sort of disturbed us. And what we learned middle of last year was that they'd already started running clinical trials using these rules to allocate patients to treatment arms. They're doing this using pemetrexid and cisplatin, pemetrexid and venorelbine, docetaxel and doxorubicin. And for several of these drugs, these are in cases where in the posted signatures, they've gotten the sensitive and resistant labels reversed. So we think this is a problem. So we wrote up a paper on this. We first circulated it to a biological journal and got the comment back that we're sorry, this story, this story seems too negative. Can you fix that? Um, <laughs> at which point we said, well, we probably can't. So we sent it off to the Annals of Applied Statistics on the 1st of September. It was accepted and published online by the 14th, at which point it was covered by the press. Duke starts an internal investigation and suspended the trials pending the outcome of the investigation. That was October of last year. So what happened next? As of the end of January of this year, Duke decided to restart the trials. And in particular, they said that their investigation, which was now concluded, had strengthened their confidence in this evolving approach to personalized cancer treatment. Now, we were not really pleased by this. And the main reason we were not really pleased is that we asked them, well, OK, we don't understand the data. Can you show us the data and stuff that you used to, come to reach this conclusion? And they said, well, no. While the reviewers that conducted these things approved of our sharing our report with the National Cancer Institute, we consider it a confidential document. So no, you can't see it, um, which disturbed us. And as a side note, there's, there's just one more thing, um, which is that this investigation took place between October and January. Well, as it happens, in November, something new happened. In November, they posted data. They posted new data for one paper dealing with cisplatin and pemetrexid. These are two of the drugs they're using in clinical trials. And in this data, they said, here are the 59 samples that we're using as a validation set to show that this works. These 59 samples are a subset of this one geo data set, and we're using it to make predictions. So we said, OK, cool. We see these 59 samples. We've got the ovarian ones. Let's go in and take a look at them. So the very first thing we did with these 59 samples so we said, let's go back to the geo data set and see if we can match them up. And when we did, here's what we found. So what if the names matched up for all the, for all the 59 samples, we should see 59 red squares lying on this blue diagonal line. How many red squares do you see lying on that blue diagonal line? This is not a hard counting question. None. 43 of the samples, they got the labels wrong. For 16, they didn't get the labels wrong, or at least the problem is for these 16, we can't tell. The reason we can't tell is that for those 16, they've scrambled the gene labels so badly that we don't know what samples they correspond to. What this means is that for their validation data set, every single sample is incorrect for two drugs they've been using in clinical trials for two years. 
We think this is disturbing. So what happened next? We pointed this out at the end of January. No response. So we then said, can we do anything else? And it occurred to us that they said, well, we won't show you the report, but the reviewers approved of us sending it to the NCI. Now, the NCI in the US is a federally funded institution. And what that means is that they are subject to federal law, specifically the Freedom of Information Act. So in April, we filed a request with the NCI to get the report under the Freedom of Information Act. And at the start of May, a redacted version of the report was indeed supplied. And we looked at it and we found a few things that were rather interesting in the report or weren't in the report. The two main things that we found were that first off, the review committee that went through this stuff, the people who evaluated it said, by the way, we couldn't figure out from the data that's been published how to do this. The only way we got it is because there was extra information supplied to us. And we really recommend that the investigators make that public. So that's one thing. The other thing that we found rather disturbing was what wasn't there. Specifically, this report makes no mention of those problems with cisplatin and pemetrexid that I just told you about. It's not there. So we pointed this out in May. And also in May, we asked the National Cancer Institute, what do you think about what's going on? And well, they said, let's look at the trials. We actually don't fund those three cl clinical trials. We do fund another one. It's a phase three. And actually, based on that, they reinvestigated the rationale. And they yanked that signature from the phase three clinical trial in the middle of the trial. That's mid-May. We said, OK, is there anything further that's going to happen with, these, with the three ongoing trials at Duke? Nothing happened. Nothing happened for two more months. And then in mid-July, we found out something new that's a bit orthogonal from your normal statistics. One of the PIs used to claim he was a Rhodes Scholar. The Rhodes Trust in Britain says, no, no, he wasn't. Um, so indeed, uh, it appears there was some CV fudging involved. Now, what happened then was that I knew that there were a few statisticians who'd been talking about saying, maybe we should write a letter or something. So I emailed a few of them uh, the day this came out and said, you know, if you want to write a letter, now's about the best time. So the following Monday, three days later, there was a letter from 31, 33 biostatisticians, uh, find a few that you like. Um, and the cancer letter comments that Duke's administrators have accomplished something monumental. They triggered a public expression of outrage from biostatisticians. Ooh, cool. But the fun thing about this letter was that it went to the newly appointed head of the National Cancer Institute, Harold Varmus, and to Duke, and to the DOD, and to the press. So this one got some coverage. So what happened then? Duke suspended the trials. This has since been covered just a bit in a few other outlets like NPR, Science, Nature, and some other fly-by-night journals. Um, and a few other investigations are underway. And there's actually a new Google group devoted entirely to reproducible research and things like that. But as we've been looking at this, there is a caveat that I think we should keep in mind. And that caveat is that, unfortunately, some of these mistakes, like the off by one, we've seen them before. This is not the only time. We've seen some of these examples going back to 2002, 2003, 2005. These types of errors have been around for a while. This is an egregious combination, but the problems are there. So some observations. Um, the most common mistakes are simple ones. For example, in statistics, the simplest one here for genomics is complete confounding of the experimental design. Others involve mixing up sample labels, gene labels, things that are easy to do in Excel. OK? Those are easy to mistake. Now, the fun thing about simple mistakes is that if you see them, they're easy to fix. But if the documentation is poor, you won't see them. So they will slip by because our intuition is no good. And what that means is that if you go out to the literature, we sort of suspect that the most simple mistakes are more common than we would like to admit. Now, what would we like to have happen? Well, for papers, we've got a little uh, thing of saying, here's some things we really would like to see. In addition to data like the stuff at GEO, we'd really like some idea of, if you're going to supply us with a table of quantifications, please label the columns, tell us which samples are which, and provide code. So these are some other things. And these are re recommendations for papers, but we think they should be absolute requirements before you start clinical trials. Now, do we, uh, as the phrase goes, walk the walk? What do we do? Well, partially in response to this, about uh, in early 2007, Kevin Coombs and I went into our, dep our Department of Bioinformatics at MD Anderson. We said, guess what? Henceforth, we are announcing by fiat that all reports that we write are now going to be written in S-Weave, combination of R and LaTeX. The fun thing about S-Weave is that you can take these reports, you can run them through R, somebody else can run them through R and get the same numbers. 
As a side note, most of our reports now go are written by stat analyst faculty member teams. The analyst writes the report, submits it to the faculty member, the faculty member proofreads it, reruns the code if necessary, and only after that second approval does it go off to the biological PI. This has actually helped our reproducibility quite a bit. So actually, if you ask us what we did in any report going back for about three years now, we can tell you exactly. We find that useful. But the buzz phrase in all of this is reproducible research. Now, so I've given you some observations and I've told you the lessons that I really want you to derive from it. So I have one last slide and that is to acknowledge some folks. So Kevin Coombs is my primary co-author in all of these things. Some other folks at MD Anderson, the various groups that provided money at the MD Anderson. And of course, if you want to read more, you can go to the Annals of Applied Statistics and you can read the paper, you can look at the code. Even better, you can cite the paper because that'll make me famous and my mom happy and she can buy me more microarray ties for Christmas. Um, and I have one last acknowledgement, which is to you, my kind audience for bearing with me for the past half hour, and that's what I got. Thanks, you. Thank you very much. No, no, no. there must be questions. What sort of validation do you think is appropriate in those finding part of Okay, for fi things that would be appropriate for going to clinical trials. First off, the rule needs to be specified sufficiently uh, precisely that an independent person outside of that group can rerun it and get the same numbers. Since lots of clinical trials are run at institutions with their own institutional review board, it should be specified clearly enough for a representative of that institutional review board to run it and get the same numbers. This will typically be a biostatistician at the Associated Cancer Center. They should be able to do that. In going from one, going from in particular cell lines, et cetera, we would really like to see this replicated in an independent data set, at least one beyond the one that you've got. The other one thing that we toss in that, uh, just as a caveat to guard against some of the um, uh, confounding issues that we've talked about. Uh, in particular, for any finding that we, f that we look at that says, wow, this is wonderful, our first reaction at this point is, okay, what type of batch effect did we miss? So we tend to take the genes that are most interesting, and before we use them, we plot them as a function of run date, simply to see, do we see obvious batch effects that might cause us to be curious? But those are the very quick and dirty things that I can think of. There's a more extensive list, but that will take longer to explain. Okay? Okay. Yes? This is actually mainly a comment. We saw similar situation in a in less critical uh, issue like uh, cell line and things, experiments like that that we use using uh, meta-analysis from things coming from uh, the GEO database. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one of the main problems, uh, I think, is related to the fact that the vast majority of the reviewer of the biological journal will trust all the part related to the microarray analysis and we completely skip it. Simply they take the final results and they evaluate how those fit to uh, the, the um, evidence that are coming from the wet lab. And this is actually the problem. When I review some of these microarray paper, normally the first Time, I have always to ask for extra information but are never enough in the, in the methods. But this is a general situation for everything that is handled by the biological reviewer. Yeah, um, actually that's a general problem. That's not the whole problem, in part because I, there is no way that any individual reviewer could have caught all the problems that we talked about because that involves detailed examination of the raw data. Um, what we do ask right now when, we, when, we're, when I'm reviewing papers, for example, is I look and say, all right, do they tell me where the data is? Do they give me a, a URL or something? Do they tell me where I can find the code? Are the links actually live? Can I see it? I don't go through and check it for accuracy at that time, so that's a bit of an issue. We are actually in the process of talking to a large number of journal editors and funding agencies even now to say, uh, guys, we need to fix this. So actually some of this is going on with the editors of the Nature family because they're not too happy that this showed up in Nature Medicine for some reason. Um, and they're saying, okay, we'd like to fix that. How can we fix that? One of the things that we're looking at is both specifying a minimal set of things, that's that short uh, note up there, but the other thing that we're talking about is for some papers, one of the ideas that we've been bandying about is having, in addition to, say, a specified statistical review, in some cases having a specified reproducibility review and saying if you've got something, particularly in the New England Journal or Nature Medicine, one, where it might lead to a clinical trial, you send it off to a group and say, okay, your job as a reviewer is simply to run the code and say, does it generate the figures that show up in the paper? 
does it do that? And that's going to delegate the workload and may, if people know that it's going to be checked for reproducibility before it's published, the chance of actually getting that code and documentation is orders of magnitude better. So that's our best fix to that. Yes, it is a problem, but we're, we're trying to address that. Okay. Yes. So you gave one very detailed example of uh, one group which both was uh, appalling in its systematic uh, aspects and, and the implications of the clinical trial, but how often, I assume that that's not the only thing that you tried, how often do you see such mistakes uh, beyond um, this example? We have frequently seen mistakes that involve column transpositions, row transpositions, in some cases with quantification matrices, column offsets. And I've seen these in data sets that have come to me within MD Anderson. You will never see these data sets. They have never left MD Anderson before I fixed them. Um, they, we have also seen these in other papers in the literature. Most of the time, you won't see us talking about those too many because we haven't looked at anywhere at most of them at anywhere near this level of depth, and we can't because actually reconstructing this takes a hell of a lot of time. Um, all, we estimated that this took us somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 hours to figure out how all this worked. Um, and the only reason we went into that level of detail here was because of the direct clinical application and because of the requests from clinical PIs at MD Anderson. Um, we know that some of the simple mistakes are common. I won't even, as a first pass, I tend not to try to use too many microarray experiments before 2005 because the rate of complete confounding is so high. If you've got Affymetrics data sets, one of the things you can do from the cell files is you can pull out the run dates from the headers and you can plot things that way to see if that's a problem. Um, yes, there are other simple problems like that. We know that they are more widespread than just this example. Um, so we know it needs to be fixed. We still refer to this as our uh, example case study because it tends to focus the attention. Colin has a question on that. Yeah, we've had this uh, sort of problem elsewhere in, in science, and one policy that was sort of adopted is that two separate groups who do, who do not interact actually analyze the data or derive the theorem or whatever mm -hmm. totally separately because when people make mistakes, they tend to fly off at a tangent all over the place. So they, they do not make the same mistake if they're totally separate groups. So is mm -hmm. that a reasonable strategy? That is a reasonable strategy, yeah. um, particularly if you're just talking about the analysis. Actually, to a certain extent, having somebody else be independently able to reproduce the analysis, as I was just mentioning for an IRB, mm -hmm. or, that's one thing that we would really like to see. Um, in particular, before going to clinical trials, having some other group try to at least qualitatively reproduce the findings, as, I mean, I'm going to say qualitatively, not just exactly reproduce the analytical results, that would, that's also something we would mm -hmm. find very mm -hmm. reassuring. Mm -hmm. So we would love to see it. It's not often done. Um, okay. So thank you again. Okay. I mean, not only for the talk, but also for doing all the work.